So you are a baby, and you're given a copy of Final Fantasy 1 for your birthday. The King of Cornelia asks you to rescue his daughter, Princess Sarah, and after spending an hour scratching your head over why the game isn't 3D like one little moron, you make your way into the Chaos Temple and come face to face with the embodiment of fear itself wrapped tightly in a thick layer of iron garlic. You knock him down easily, which has got a sting considering this bold statement, and you leave to continue your adventure. But some of you may have been left scratching scratching your heads over what this guy's problem even was. Why did he kidnap the lady? Who is the man behind the mask? Why is he so mean? Well, years later, and we might get ourselves some answers, with Koei Tecmo's Stranger of Paradise Final Fantasy Origin. Now, if you're someone who isn't on social media, first of all, I'm legitimately happy for you, god I wish that were me, and second, you might have missed a very peculiar event that occurred when Stranger of Paradise first got announced. People kind of collectively lost their shit in a grand explosion of emotion, as some people were rolling their eyes about another Final Fantasy game with handsome boys dressed in very very non-fantasy clothing, as some people were already making memes over the trailer's borderline fetishization of the MC's hatred for chaos, and others were excited for that early mid-2000s edge that a lot of us thought to be extinct. Combine that with the potential that this could be a legitimately good game, and well, sign me up please. I definitely got caught up in the hype that this could be a shitpost with fun gameplay, but I knew I'd have to temper myself when making a video on it. The trailer might have accidentally cherry-picked lines which made it seem even more campy than it actually was, and for all we knew, it could turn out to be an unironic masterpiece that would pass into the Hall of Legends for being a five-star work of art. I don't know, I'm not a prediction wizard. I knew I was in for a fun ride when I booted up my PlayStation 5 and almost had my ears blown out. Oh God, what the fuck? What the f so before I dive into minor spoilers, I want to give my very brief overall impression of the game so people who want to play this 100% blind can get a little glimpse into my sloppy little brain thoughts. I really enjoyed myself, more than I was expecting, which was a very welcome surprise, and I strongly believe this will become a cult classic in a few years' time. But it's definitely one of those games where the issues aren't being very stealthy, and I'm sure this won't surprise you, but the dialogue and, well, cutscenes in general general can sometimes, not all the time, feel like they hired an alien to write them. Not as much as you'd expect from the first trailer, but enough where people who want to jump into this for a polite chuckle here or there can probably, you know, do that. It does seem that through pure chance, the trailers kind of rolled up all of the unintentional funny bits and revealed that to us, which led a lot of people to believe it was going to be a so bad it's good game. It isn't that, it's just good. Sure, you can genuinely laugh at Jack's sincere yet charming hatred towards Final Fantasy Satan, and sure, the execution might not be as neatly polished as I'd like, but I don't think I'd put this many hours into the game if I didn't enjoy myself. I'd just drop it. So, from this point on, I'll be covering the game's intro up to the ending of the first demo, then a larger spoiler segment where I talk about the game's story in more detail, then moving on to gameplay. Also, quick aside, but apologies if some of the audio in this video sounds a little crusty. I've been moving house, so some of it may sound a little more cave-like than other parts. I've done the best I can, I'm so sorry. I'll be sure to post spoiler segments where necessary, and speaking of, if you want to go in completely blind, here's a timecode, but I do need to make it absolutely clear that the gameplay segment will have the full party roster in it, as well as job abilities that you'll be unlocking later into the game, and footage of the four themes. So if you don't want to see that, I completely understand, and I'll see you all later. But for the rest of you, let's get this party started. Three, two, one, and go. The game's intro starts, and it immediately has me hooked. This is a really powerful opening, and cements Garland as a figure you do not want to cross. I was talking with a few people about this before the video was even a thing, but can you imagine the reception if the very first trailer we got for Stranger of Paradise was this cutscene? Just cut here, and boom, title drop. Vocal cords damaged, bull sacks drained. Garland is back, baby. All of that said, however, I still strongly believe the marketing we did get helped the game out in ways the developers probably didn't imagine, especially since in interviews they seem kinda taken back that the chaos meme even became a thing in the first place. But as this header states, you know, it's publicity, and hey, it made me wanna buy it. So we cut from the intro straight into a fight with Mean Green and the Surprise Queen, who we beat fairly easily. A little too easily, as one of her heads recently 
respawn and farts out a nasty dark gas which engulfs the party. We don't find out what happened, however, as the very next scene we see the world's most unintentional comedian, Jack, walking to the city of Cornelia with his memories wiped, meeting back up with his teammates who find themselves in the same position as he is. The only connecting force between the three are the insatiable urge to force feed chaos into a fucking wood chipper, and the mysterious J.O. crystals they keep on their persons at all times. The spiritual energy transferred between bros transcends memory loss, after all. Now, the story at this point is fairly simple. You've got three warriors of light with suspiciously dark crystals following the original story of Final Fantasy 1 with little changes here or there. For example, we're sent to the Chaos Shrine to seek down the source of the darkness plaguing the land and eradicate it. However, Princess Sarah is still, I mean, <laughs> Fine. Just playing away. Oh, what a banger. Already we're deviating from the intro and Final Fantasy 1 in general. Especially when Sarah asks us to track down an individual named Garland, who, as we all know, kidnaps her at the very start of the game. Even when we enter the Chaos Shrine and track down Garland, it's a fucking imposter. Yet despite the fact they can't turn people into delicious strawberry chunks, they can pose like an absolute champ. Though geek your heart out. After beating sussy Garland, it's revealed to be a lady named Neon, who breaks the news to the party that chaos is a big fat lie. It's a fairy tale cooked up to give the people hope that evil and darkness in the world can be destroyed by defeating a singular enemy, instead of the painful realization that the eradication of true evil is never that simple. So Neon attempted to make a pact with the darkness in order to become that singular enemy, so the world could have their hope restored via her sacrifice. And in what can only be described as the Leonardo da Vinci of comebacks, we get this widely loved scene. Bullshit. I love him so much. After this, Neon becomes the fourth member of the J.O. Crystal Club, and the story continues to open up from here. Introducing us to old Final Fantasy 1 characters, such as Astos, with a distinct Yasified twist, and of course, solving the mysteries of a world one fiend at a time. Gonna drop a second spoiler warning here, I'll be discussing things beyond the demo without going into too much detail for a bit, so please be warned, 3, 2, 1. From this point on, the story will gradually open up, and personally, the further along it went, the more I was getting invested. It's by no means a 10 out of 10 piece of revolutionary storytelling, but it was never ever trying to be, and I ended up loving it for what it was. In some ways, it reminded me of Crisis Core, and how that expanded upon the story of Zack, but instead of everyone's favourite Labrador, you have the story of why and how Jack Garland did what he did. Picking and choosing elements of Final Fantasy 1's universe and expanding on them just enough that it makes a coherent narrative, such as the not-so-subtle connection between Jack's friends and the fiends, Astos and his surprisingly tragic storyline that elevated him to being one of my favourites, and the Lufenians, who in one was simply an advanced civilization of humanoids who previously lived in the sky, to the villainous masterminds of the game's entire mythos by orchestrating this Groundhog Day-esque scheme to make sure they, and only they, can live in their own version of paradise by cycling siphoning darkness to the human world. Jack goes through a pretty decent character arc, which I was happy to see, and him and his friends eventually rise up to become the heroes the world needs by the end, even if that means wearing the mask of a villain. It's a true heroic sacrifice, and God damn it, I'm a sucker for that shit. But in order to experience all of this for yourselves, you'll first need to learn how to control the man who's too impatient and plain pissed off to sit around and listen to the fucking bollocks you're about to spew. I am. I don't give a fuck. She's an icon, she's a legend, and she is the moment. So, how can one learn to temper this adorable little ball of fun? Well, let's start talking about the gameplay, and I'll help you figure things out. Gameplay in Stranger of Paradise has a surprisingly large amount of stuff going on. Enough where I was writing the script and looking at my notes going, oh my god, this video is going to be 10 hours long. So trying to condense it has been a fun challenge in and of itself. Taking control of Jack, you have your basic attack combos that you execute with R1. You use this on enemies to make them dead. But wait! What if I told you you can make them deader? Or in some cases, redderer? Oh. 
Every enemy has a break meter that is displayed here. You can slowly chip away at it with a basic attack, but using a combo ability with R2 can break enemies even faster and deal a nice amount of damage at the service of using MP. Each passing swing of your weapon will allow you to use another combo ability that you yourself can allocate. Other methods of increasing your break chances are back attacks and sending them flying into the wall. Oya oya, could you be chaos? <laughs> Once an enemy is broken, Jack can swoop in and initiate a Soul Burst. This is an ability you'll be using a lot, and it'll restore MP and increase your MP bar. And the shockwave that occurs afterwards can potentially cause a chain reaction to other enemies. This never got old, especially since every enemy has a unique Soul Burst animation, so for me, being the curious type, whenever I'd see a new enemy, I'd find myself saying, good heavens, look at the fucking time. Up next is your evasion and methods of defense. You have a simple sidestep where you press X and a double tap will allow you to roll. Standard stuff, we like that. Defending is a whole different ballpark, however, since you have a regular defend option which does its job well, but the soul shield is where things get a little spicy. The soul shield is what I like to call your pocket blue mage. You see, enemies have four attack types. There's a basic attack, an orange attack which can be blocked normally, a red attack which needs to be dodged and cannot be blocked, and a purple attack. Purple attacks can effectively be slurped up by the soul shield and be thrown back at an enemy using the square button. Hence my little blue mage comparison. Some additional things the soul shield can do is act as a less effective but still very useful soul burst when it comes to restoring MP and increasing your magic with every blocked attack, at the expense of your break gauge being slowly depleted. And you can press R1 after blocking in order to counterattack. Now you might be laughing behind your hand with all of your cool friends at the regular defend option at this point. How can this little stinky winky possibly live up to the Chad soul shield? I know, I get it. But let's rewind a bit to the break meter, because despite the shield's impossibly sexy exterior, it's actually quite fragile and will break Jack faster than my parents' marriage. <laughs> I'm fine. So it's good to alternate. Even without the soul shield, you'll find that Jack put all of his skill points into strength and none in poise. So be careful, don't rely too heavily on the soul shield, and remember that variety is the spice of life. And speaking of variety, ooh, we arrive at my favorite inclusion in any RPG, the pure, unfiltered Klemp's Kino that is the job system. And they give you a lot of jobs to play around with here. 28 in total. It's an all-you-can-eat buffet, and I'm gonna be vomiting in the car park later. Willingly. I regret nothing. The Sourceman and Duelist and Swordfighter Pugilist, Ronin and Lancer and Mage. Marauder and Monk, a Warrior Thief, a Knight and a Goddamn Red Mage. Berserker Dragoon, White Mage Samurai, a Ninja Assassin and Sage. A Tyrant Dark Knight, a Breaker Void Knight, a Paladin and a Black Mage. A Liberator and a Big Boss Boiler, and oh god this list is so long. Now Jack starts off with your basic selection of jobs. You can pick a couple, which you can change on the fly with the triangle button, and as you beat enemies you'll be leveling up which will grant you skill points. You then allocate your skill points in order to give yourself more combo abilities and other useful stuff to make your journey a little easier. When you hit the bottom, you can unlock a brand new job, some requiring you to max two different ones in order to progress any further. The craziest thing about the sheer size of the job roster is how I was still discovering ones beyond completing the game, and I actually liked them more than the ones I was playing during my main playthrough. This is why the best piece of advice I can give you is to experiment with as many basic jobs as you can nice and early. In my case, I stuck with jobs I didn't really like early on, and it made me enjoy the game a lot less. Ignore the fact that you share the same job as your party member and have fun with it. Trust me. By the end of the game, my personal favourites were Sage, Tyrant, and Breaker. Sage was surprising since I wasn't expecting a mage class to feel fun in an action game, but they made it work quite well, giving them a mace that deals great physical damage and elemental combo abilities, as well as being able to swap between black and white magic as their default ability. Tyrant is one of those jobs I discovered after beating the game, and I cannot tell you how much that pisses me off because it's just so good. Imagine a spell sword 
world. Now include Spell Mace, Spell Fist, Spell Knife, and Spell Lance. Bada boom, you've got yourself a tyrant. I turned mine into a Spell Fist because a monk's combo abilities were the most fun for me as a player. Being super fast, flashy, and with the added bonus of setting your fists on fire, I'm sure you can see why this is a personal favorite. Breaker is pure, unadulterated sex for two simple reasons. You can equip and use a ton of different weapons and combo abilities, and their default ability is Zantetsken. This deals a fuck ton of fantastic damage, and if they break or die after using it, they'll instantly soul burst. What's not nice. to like? You can increase the strength and affinity of your chosen job by progressing through skill trees and also with equipment that will fall out of enemies like their violent pinatas. And the equipment, or should I say equipment management, is without a doubt something I'd want them to improve on if we ever got another game similar to this, because it's a little... I don't know. For me it was a little messy. It's kind of difficult to explain, but it's all clumped together, and there were times when I wanted to see what armor would benefit, let's say, a marauder specifically, or order things depending on a specific job affinity, which gives you stat bonuses, but you can't really do that. It just sorts stuff depending on how new the item is, highest physical attack, etc. Job affinity, which focuses on the highest number percentage, even if it isn't the job you want to focus on. Item type, which you'd think is okay, but again, some stuff here might benefit a mage more than a warrior. And then there's the fact that your inventory has a limit to how many pieces of armor can be stored at a time. So you need to dismantle them to turn them into raw materials that you use to boost special effects on other pieces of equipment, but you can't make it so your party member's armor is hidden from this menu, so you have to look out for this teeny tiny indicator for ants that show that it's equipped by a certain member of your team, meaning you can't just select everything because your party member's armor will also be selected, and it's just... What's this stress? <laughs> if fixes can be patched in at a later date, maybe with the season path stuff, then that will be fantastic, and I don't even care if it dates this video. I'm sure for some people this won't affect them at all, but it personally has me edging an aneurysm every time I want to free up space in my storage. Now I had to write this bit in because it is important. But whilst working on this video, they released patch 1.03, which adds the auto dismantle option, which is a much needed time saver. So if you were annoyed on release, about needing to manually scroll down, dismantling every little thing, have no fear. This is a great improvement. So with all this under your belt, you'll find yourself flying through the game. There are, without a doubt, a bunch of enemies that gave me a rough time, but so long as you utilize everything the game has given you, you'll find yourself locked in a comfortable loop of bonking, breaking, and smashing. My first real hurdle was against the first fiend, Tiamat. It got so bad at one point, I even broke out the tutorial again, just to make sure I wasn't forgetting anything. Because let me tell you, if I wasn't playing this on the PS5 with the fast load times, there probably wouldn't be a video at this point. Turns out I was forgetting something, and it's a feature that I'd barely used up until that point. Lightbringer is a command ability that you can use by holding L2 and selecting it using the D-pad. It uses up two charges of the magic bar and is a goddamn lifesaver during boss fights. With every attack, it'll increase the enemy's break speed and the break gauge is lowered. Breaking a boss gives you a free soul burst and a massive chunk of damage is dealt. Part of the reason I forgot this was a thing in the first place is because regular enemies broke fairly easily, so by the time a boss rolled around I was basically playing the game with my training weights left on. Not even the game's fault, it's just me being a fucking melon. But melon or not, another thing that kept pushing me forward were actually the dungeons, or at least the design of them. When I found out what they were going for, I damn near shit myself. They based virtually all of them on specific zones in other Final Fantasy games. You can see which one it is in the loading screen. For example, Dimension 2 is Final Fantasy 2, etc, etc. My personal favorites were the one based off Sastasha from Final Fantasy 14, Final Fantasy 6's Floating Continent, and of course, Final Fantasy 9's Evil Forest. Forest. This one is a no-brainer since it's my favorite zone in Final Fantasy IX as well, and each zone comes with their own personalized remix of the dungeon's original theme.
Now, I really did like these, don't get me wrong here, but is anyone else on the same wavelength as me when I say I really think the game could have benefited from about 10 times more butt rock? Maybe Revengeance has poisoned my brain here, but with the crazy shit you do in some of these fights, like countering a goddamn flare with your fists, it felt as if butt rock overslept and they had to call in an equally talented but much more serious replacement of the last minute. What else can I add here? Um, attack cancelling sometimes feels a little delayed, depending on certain jobs I used, might have been doing it wrong or simply a controller issue. Chaos mode is something that unlocks after you complete the game, and it's pretty cool. It adds a whole other layer of difficulty and a little bit of grinding, which may upset a few people, but for me, I was okay with it. This particular mission can lick the floor of my bathroom, I don't care, I got so annoyed. <laughs> It's still pretty fun, though! Dragon Quest XI-S is really good and you should buy it. And energy drinks no longer affect me anymore. My body refuses to absorb the caffeine and it feels like I'm stuck in a permanent sleep-deprived limbo. And... Hi there, guys. Rat Bastard here. I'm having a lot of difficulty moving on to the next scene. Uh, so you just get to hear me ramble for a little bit. And, um... Ah, I mean... Are you alright? I mean, like, are you, are you alright? Are you good? Filed your taxes? What what games you been playing? Anything fun? Watching any anime this season? M moving, moving on! G g g g so, to conclude this video, I'm sure you can see by this point that I hold a pretty positive opinion of this game. Whilst fully admitting and embracing the fact that it wears its flaws on its sleeve. I wasn't expecting the game to be perfect, and I know for a fact that many of you may disagree with my overall assessment, and that's okay. My taste in games is a little all over the place at this point, that's for sure. Cult classics are going to be divisive. They are going to be widely showered with praise, and sometimes it's okay to embrace the silly side of the game, even if it wasn't what the developers intended. I'd say give it a go if anything from this video interests you, and just try to go in with an open mind. We have more content coming in the form of a season pass, so Jack's little grumpy dumpy isn't going to be out of the headlines anytime soon. On that note, it's time for a little self-advertising. Be sure to follow me over on Twitch if you want to hang out with me outside of my videos. I'm going to be rebranding both that and the podcast in the upcoming months, which I really, really can't wait for. Don't worry, this channel will remain ever the same. And I'd also like to take the time to thank some of my very beloved patrons. Those being Random Fan, Twilight Tiger, Stephen Bard, and Mimi. Thank you so much for being the most patient group of people I know. It really means a lot, especially when I was making this video whilst moving house, which just meant it was being pushed further and further back. I truly appreciate it, and I hope I can continue to make you proud from here. Thanks for watching, everyone, and I'll see you all next time.